Hi and welcome to Green Tubers. Today I'm going to be reviewing our Mitsubishi Eco Down heat pump. So as you may well know, the success of an air source heat pump like we've got or a ground source heat pump will often be determined by the situation you have with your own property. These things produce uh, water um, at a much lower temperature than a conventional boiler and that has to be dealt with or used in the correct manner inside the house. Frankly, we're not at the moment, we're part way through an innovation, so we have triple glazed windows in some places, but only really old, poor double glazed windows in others. Um, it's not particularly airtight, we've got some underfloor insulation, but it's only 20 mil in some places, whereas it's 150 mil in others, and we still have our old radiators with, uh, in some cases, teeny tiny pipes thinner, than, thinner than my finger. And that's not ideal, but despite that, uh, the good news is that this thing handles it all very well. It's not perfect, on some days it does feel slightly cool, but only on the coldest of days, and I know when we finish our house improvements, no, I'm confident that when we finish our house improvements, this thing will, will actually be perfect. In terms of noise, I don't know if you can hear it behind me, but there's a slight hum at the moment. This is it sort of in a low medium mode. It can get a, la a lot louder than this, but never so loud that it's uncomfortable. Uh, we can't hear it from inside the house generally. If we opened a window, we could, uh, but naturally when it's coldest and this thing's making the most noise we've got the windows closed so it's no problem and i have no complaints over the noise of the outside unit and generally the whole thing's pretty good we picked this one actually because it's well known to be one of the quieter uh, models on the market uh, and as well as being uh, well known for, for being very reliable this particular one is a 14 kilowatt unit you can get smaller ones uh, this one's got two fans and the smaller power units have a single fan and they, they sit a lot lower. Um, it's quite big, I mean, I'm not, I'm not very tall, but you can see it comes up to my shoulder. I'm perhaps slightly below average height, um, but it's a big box. It's not attractive, it's not horrendous either. Um, we do plan to build like a um, partly open fence around it, so it's slightly hidden. At the moment, it's not that well hidden. Right, moving inside, I'll show you some of the bits in there that I like, some of the bits that I'm not so keen on. Right, it's nice and warm, taking my jacket off, and let's get on to uh, the bits I don't like so much. So, this is the inside part of it. This is a 250 litre hot water cylinder which we had installed. Now, not negative per se, but it is big, so big that we actually had to uh, totally dismantle our old airing cupboard and build, uh, rebuild it with the wall further out to accommodate this big tank. All of the bits and pieces, the pumps and the control systems are actually uh, come stuck onto the front of the cylinder, whereas on our old one, the cylinder was separate and all the motors and things were screwed to the wall. So that's more just something to be aware of. But what is it I don't like about it? Well, firstly, it's actually loud. It's not really, really loud, but in the dead of night, when the pumps are running, it's actually quite noticeable to the point where we just have it turned off at night. It's not quite as efficient to do it that way, but um, we just can't live with the noise. I've got young children, I get woken up enough in the night as it is, I don't need these pumps running. I wish they'd have been, they'd be quieter, I'm sure it's possible to get quieter pumps, and if I'd have known that they were as noisy as they are, I would have considered siting the cylinder somewhere else in our house. It would have been more hassle, but I think it would have been worth it, given that the airing cupboard's almost central to all of our sleeping spaces. So the noise is probably the biggest sort of bugbear. It's not terrible, but it's just a bit of a pain. The next thing I don't like about it is the control mechanism. The Nest thermostat has been out for over a decade now. Now, when it came out, it was quite innovative, but now that 10 years have passed, you'd have thought that some big company like Mitsubishi would have thrown enough time and money behind it to come up with something which was comparable. They haven't. The control system for this sucks and the mobile app to go with it is unforgivable. It's absolutely awful. It's a real pain to use to the point where I never ever used it, use it at all. If I'd have known it was as bad as this, I would actually have considered going with a different manufacturer and had a look. I just assumed, foolishly, that the Mitsubishi system would be pretty good and it's not. I mean, in fairness, I'm not there on a daily basis fiddling with it, so it's not, um, 
it's not like a massive problem, but it is something I would think twice about before buying. I would go and investigate some of their competitors. And lastly, and this is just seems like a minor point, but it just shows you, I think, perhaps um, some attention to detail. I don't know. It has various frost protection mechanisms, which is perfectly understandable. There are some which control the heat pump itself to stop the heat pump from freezing. There are also other modes which keep water flowing between uh, the heat pump and inside and out so that the pipes themselves don't freeze and that's all very sensible. However, the lowest temperature you can set before this lock kicks in is plus five degrees. So at any time the temperature is five degrees or lower, the frost protection mechanism turns on that means the pumps run. As I've just mentioned, the pumps are quite loud, which means that most of the time through the winter, this thing wants to start running to stop the pipes from freezing. But plus five is actually pretty warm. Water doesn't freeze until zero, and isn't just water running through these pipes, it's got glycol in it, and glycol is an antifreeze, and that means the pipes won't freeze until it reached probably something like minus 15. It never gets to minus 15 in this country, so uh, what's the point? I don't understand why they don't allow you to set the temperature to something more sensible, like minus five instead of plus five. Minus five would be cold enough for you to want to consider running the frost protection on the pipes, but not so cold that it's going to run pretty much every night through the winter months. The result is we've turned it all off, which doesn't fill me with you know, confidence, I would actually rather it was running, but I just can't be putting up with the, uh, the noise and the expense of the pumps running all day. And there's various other little sort of minor, more minor smart elements. So this has uh, a protection, another protection mode on it um, for uh, Legionnaire's disease. So once a week, the temperature in the tank goes up to, I think the high 60s or something like that. And it does that via the immersion, I think. Regardless, it heats the water in the tank up to a high enough temperature to get rid of the disease and protect your family. Bingo, brilliant. However, we've got solar thermal panels and the temperature in the tank routinely gets to temperatures above that um, just by virtue of the solar thermal boosting the water. It doesn't take any notice of that. So if the water was up to 68 or 70 degrees yesterday, it doesn't care. It still runs the Legionnaire's protection. So uh, you'd have thought it would recognise it, and instead of routinely running it weekly, regardless, it would say, well, when was the last time it was above a given temperature? Because for six months of the year, we don't need it to run, and we could save ourselves a lot of money, we could consume a lot less energy by not having that happen. So there are various little sort of smart elements that are absent. It's not as smart as it should be. It's missing all the sort of weather compensation stuff with regards to not turning on if it knows it's going to be a hot sunny day within the next hour, you know, you know skip it. There's loads of stuff in the nest which we had, again, 10 years ago that this thing simply doesn't have. Maybe they can't have it. Maybe it's patents protecting it. I don't know, but it's a bit rubbish. Which is a shame because the unit itself seems reliable, it seems fantastic, it does a really good job and we, you know with the actual performance of the unit we've been very pleased it just comes down to sort of smart technology and some of the control systems which which let it down a bit would i buy it again probably it kind of depends if i did my research and found that all of the other ones had equally poor control systems then i'd probably go back to the mitsubishi it, it is quiet outside and it has been incredibly reliable and it works despite the fact that we don't have the best circumstances which, as I explained, we will change at some point. But there are some clear things that let it down. Anyway, that's enough me warbling on. I hope you found this very useful and uh, if you do buy one or don't buy one based on my recommendation, please let me know in the comments. Thank you!